Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Glad so many of you are aboard. We've got a big job ahead of us. I want to thank all those people who have helped so and worked so hard in the Iowa State University environmental teach-in. But this, as you all must recognize, is just the beginning. We've got a long ways to go. We're going to need all of your help. So let's get on with it and uh, see what we have to do in the years ahead. We're very fortunate today to have Dr. Paul R. Ehrlich, population ecologist from Stanford University, to show the way for the future. Dr. Ehrlich is the author of the Population Bomb, which was instrumental in getting this whole thing started. It's sold about a million point two, uh, one and one point two million copies, and it's uh, still going strong. And if you haven't got a copy or haven't read a copy, uh, we're selling them over here at the at the side. I think without any further ado, why we'll get on with the business at hand, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Paul R. Ehrlich. Well, I'm tremendously relieved to see that there's a reasonably pleasant reception because my name is kind of mud in Iowa. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I married the prettiest girl in this state and took her out to the smoggy coast, depriving all you guys of uh, some of your scenic beauty. But uh, it is a great pleasure to be here, not only because I spent a lot of time in Iowa, but uh, also because, for instance, your governor happens to be one of the more progressive and intelligent politicians in the country, and there's not many states where you can say that. In, in fact, the contrast with California is rather stunning. Uh, now, what I'm going to try and do is summarize my view of the current bind that we're in, and then throw the floor open to questions uh, so that you can get more detail in areas that happen to particularly interest you. I think people like to know how they got into trouble when they're trying to figure out how to get out. And so I've looked to some degree into our past to try and discover on what date we started on this downhill road. And I found it's a rather famous date in history, the 3rd of January, 8,000 BC to be exact, the date, as you all know, uh, when the agricultural revolution started. A few small groups of people living on the edge of the Fertile Crescent gave up an intensive hunting and food gathering existence and began to practice agriculture. Now, 10,000 years ago on that date, two very important things started to happen. First thing was that when man started to practice agriculture, uh, he began to live a little more secure life. He was able to grow more food. Perhaps more important, he was able to stay in one place and store it so that a, a temporary drought or something was not the disaster that it would be for a hunting and food gathering group. And as a result, the death rate in the human population began to drop. That is, the number of people per thousand per year in the population dying started slowly to go down. Now, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but fundamentally, the entire story of human population growth has been one of declining death rates while the birth rate remained high. If you want an analogy for the world demographic situation, a simple one would be to picture the world as sort of a glass globe. Picture a faucet turned on into it. That's your input into the population. That's your birth rate, the number of people being born per thousand in the population per year. The bottom of the globe, there's a drain, water pouring out of the globe, the output, your death rate. And in the globe, a certain amount of water, your population size. Well, 10,000 years ago, the faucet was on full blast. The drain was wide open. There was very little water in the globe, the equivalent of about 5 million people. And what we did, number one, at the time of the agricultural revolution, was begin slowly but surely to plug the drain, and the globe began to fill up. The second thing is also extraordinarily important. When man practices agriculture, he generally creates monocultures. That is, he takes a complex community, grassland community, or a 
a forest community where there are many different kinds of plants and animals, removes it and replaces it with a stand of a single kind of crop, often a grass. Now, unfortunately, ecological systems depend on their complexity for their stability. And therefore, what man does when he practices agriculture is he normally removes stable ecological systems and replaces them with unstable ecological systems. And unfortunately, it's the ecological systems of this planet upon which we depend for all of the food that we eat, for the oxygen in our atmosphere, for the quality of the atmosphere, for all of our waste disposal. For the first time, 10,000 years ago, then, mankind began seriously to disturb the ecology of the planet. I'll come back to that a little later. Now, what about population growth? It was slow at first. The death rate declined slowly, gradually. It took almost that full 10,000 years, back up to about 1650, to increase that 5 million people to 500 million. Our estimate is that we had about 500 million people, half a billion, in the year 1650. Now, around that time, there were further improvements in agriculture. Death rate dropped still further. Population growth spurted ahead. And it took just 200 years to increase from half a billion in 1650 to a billion people in 1850. By 1850, we were well into the Industrial Revolution. We, are on the, we were on the edge of the biomedical revolution, where for the first time, man began to specifically attack the death rate by trying to conquer disease. As a result, the death rate went down further and faster, and it took just 80 years for the population to double from a billion in 1850 to two billion in 1930. Now, we have not yet completed the doubling from two billion to four billion. If current growth rates should continue, we'll reach four billion around the middle of this decade. Now, this means, for instance, that it took uh, for man's tenure on Earth, it took 99.9999% of the time to get the first two billion people, and it will have taken 0.0001% of the time to get the second two billion people. It's very difficult to come to grips with the fact that we have 3.6 billion people today and a growth rate of 2% at compound interest. The numbers are just too large. What does it mean? Well, it means a lot of things. By every standard that we've been able to find, it means that we already have between three and seven times more people on the planet than we can permanently support. The only reason we're able to support 3.6 billion people, mostly in slums and in misery, is that we're doing something that few businessmen would approve of, and that is we're burning our capital. We are destroying our fossil fuels, we are dispersing our mineral resources, and so on. A game which cannot continue for much longer. So we're already wildly overpopulated. The growth rate is just incredible. 2% at compound interest applied to 3.6 billion people gives you roughly an annual increase of 70 million people. That's not births, that's births minus deaths. That means that every three years, there's a population equivalent of the United States to take care of uh, in this world, a new population increment. Now, even those figures are tough to come to grips with. Some people, for instance, who don't understand the scale of the problem say, gee, well, what we really need are some more little wars to keep the population down. Uh, that's not my method of choice for population control, but even if it were, let me give you a statistic that's interesting and applies to it. In all the wars the United States has fought, big and little, starting with the Revolution and on up through Laos, we have suffered 600,000 battle deaths. All our wars, we've lost 600,000 people killed in battle, approximately. World population growth now makes up that number in less than four days. So we not only have a world that is wildly overpopulated, we also have a world where the population is growing at a rate that most demographers considered impossible just 20 or 25 years ago. Current 2% rate gives us an instantaneous doubling time of something in the vicinity of 35 to 40 years. And that is a rate of growth for the entire world which simply can't be sustained even for one more doubling. Now, I've oversimplified again by telling you that the doubling time is 35 to 40 years because, of course, if you look at the Earth closely, you find two different kinds of doubling times on the planet. One kind you find in the overdeveloped nations, like the United States, the Soviet Union, Western Europe, and Japan. These nations are often doubling their populations as fast as every 70 years, growth rates slightly under, two, uh, under 1%. The United States, Soviet Union, and Japan are all right clustered around there. Western European nations tend to be a little slower. They're doubling their population every 100 years or so. Now, if you'd like to do the arithmetic, you'll quickly find out that these growth rates are preposterous. They cannot be sustained, even starting, for instance, if the whole world's population was only 200 million people like the United States, uh, all you have to do is double that every 70 years for a little while, and you find that you have an unsustainable population. We have ridiculously high growth rates in the overdeveloped countries. 
Uh, one of the reasons that the United States standard of living has plummeted over the last two decades is, of course, that we cannot keep up our facilities uh, with a population which is doubling every 70 years. It's only one context, only one context in which the growth rates in the overdeveloped nations could be considered slow, and that's if you should contrast them with the growth rates in the never-to-be-developed nations, the nations of Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, South America, and so on. Their growth rates are often in the vicinity of 3%, and your doubling times are often between 20 and 25 years. Now, I ask you to contemplate for just a moment what it means for a nation to double its population size in 20 to 25 years, a country like Honduras, say. It means if today's standard of misery is to be maintained over the next 20 years, the country will have to duplicate every amenity that it has for the support of human life. Where there's one physician today, there's going to have to be two in 20 years. Uh, where there's one home today, there's going to have to be two in 20 years. You're going to have to double your agricultural output, you're going to have to double your imports, double your exports, double the capacity of your road system, double the number of hospitals, double the number of schools, double the number of teachers, and so on and so forth. Now let's look at the United States. Faced with a 70-year doubling time, we have been unable to keep up. We have 70 years in which to duplicate the amenities for the support of life in the United States. We have not been able to do it in spite of the fact that we have a highly literate population, we have an excellent communication system. We have an excellent transport system. We have, in the general sense, a great deal of capital put away. We have armies that can march around the globe and guarantee our access to other people's resources. With all of these advantages, with all of these advantages, we're falling behind. Now, what about poor Honduras? Most of its population is illiterate. It's got an extraordinarily young population, so most of its people are not, or a great many of its people are not productive. It has no capital put aside. It has no communication system worth talking about, no road system worth talking about. It hasn't got a single soldier to send to Vietnam to help get its share of Southeast Asia's oil. Uh, it's in a real bind. The point is, of course, that although people in the never-to-be-developed countries have what Adlai Stevenson called rising expectations, they think they're going to live the kind of wasteful cowboy life that we now live in the next 10 or 20 years. A little bit of the most simple-minded arithmetic immediately shows you that they also have plummeting prospects. Although our standard of living will continue to decline as long as we survive over the next decade, say, their standard of living is going to decline even more rapidly. That is, the gap between the rich nations and the poor nations is bound to grow and grow rapidly. So we have a desperate situation in the underdeveloped countries. Now, what about the state? of mankind in general at the moment. What about the resource situation? We have this bad demographic situation. Uh, how are we doing otherwise? Well, the most important resource to man in general is food. And the world food situation, of course, as you all know, is critical. Roughly one half of the people in the world are either undernourished, they get too few calories, or they are malnourished, they don't get enough high quality protein. And although you may read in the funny papers, Time Magazine and so on, that there are A, agricultural surpluses, and B, we're going to have plenty of calories, all that is is funny paper stuff. First of all, uh, if all of the food in the world was divided equally today, everybody would have enough calories, true, but everyone would be protein malnourished. That's number one. Number two, calories aren't a problem in any case. There are people who don't get enough, but it's a distributional problem, and we could replace them easily enough. You could provide calories for everyone in the world at a world population vastly larger than the one we have now. All we would have to do is convert a great deal of our farmland to sugar beets and a lot of the tropical farmlands to sugar cane, and you can have calories coming out of your ears. You've got to understand that all the sugar beets and sugar cane grown in the world won't raise one litter of pigs or one family of people. In other words, you can eat lots of calories, but you die stone cold dead of protein malnutrition. The big problem in the world is Protein, particularly high-quality protein, that's the name of the game. High-quality protein is expensive ecologically, and it's expensive economically. If you don't get high-quality protein when you're a pregnant woman, your child is likely to grow up mentally retarded if it survives. If you don't get high-quality protein in sufficient amounts when you're a young child, your brain won't grow big, and you will grow up mentally retarded if you survive. Right now, we lose between 10 and 20 million people annually on this globe to starvation. That's the answer to the question of when will the population food crunch hit. It's already hit a lot of people. It's going to hit a lot more. Now, what about all those wonderful surpluses? Well, a number of things about them. The most important thing is that they are an indicator of the economic attitudes of our species, not of our country particularly, but of our species. This isn't more food than people can eat. It's more food than people can buy. 
If you look at the literature of agricultural economics, you find statements that would read very funny to the average person. They say things like this, if we want to keep people from starving, we've got to create more demand for food. Those are surpluses where people don't have money to buy the food. Curiously enough, people who are starving often don't have money. Another thing you want to remember about them is that they are generally low protein surpluses. I can give you a specific example of how this kind of economic surplus can be created, essentially with mirrors. In 1968, I was at the World Freedom From Hunger Conference in Washington, and there was a representative of the Philippine government there, and he announced that thanks to the new IR-8 rices, the Philippines would be able to become rice self-sufficient in 1970, and he pointed to a young Filipino farmer that he brought with him, and he said, this means that Jose's wife can have all the babies that she wants. The Philippines then proceeded to put higher price supports under rice than under corn. As a result, rice was priced out of the diets of a good number of Filipinos. They had to switch to eating corn or nothing. As a result of that, a surplus of low-quality IR8 rice was generated, which this year was dumped on the international market at way below the support price, and the Philippines announced that they were rice self-sufficient. On the day that they announced that, they also, I am told, applied to the United States government for further loans uh, to uh, keep their price support system up. Now, we have going on in the world today, thanks to the propaganda mill of the American Department of Agribusiness, among other things, something that's known as the Green Revolution. And many people have relaxed and said, OK, the Green Revolution is going to solve the food problem. Well, let me take a look at the Green Revolution for a moment. First of all, let me say that the fundamental idea behind it is an intelligent one. If you want to increase the food supply for the world, the best way to do it is by increasing yields on land already under cultivation using crops similar to the ones that are being cultivated there now. That's fundamentally how we increased our food supply uh, in the 20s and 30s, not, by the way, by using synthetic pesticides, as some companies might have you uh, believe. So uh, a Green Revolution is fundamentally a good idea. but. There are a number of problems with it. First of all, and I'm not going to go through them now, I'll be glad to later on, but just an outline. There are gross biological problems, there are gross economic problems, and there are gross sociological problems. But let's suppose that we have an absolute miracle and we avoid all of these problems or solve them rapidly. What's the best possible result we can have from trying to increase our food yield on land if we ignore all of those problems? Well, the answer, according to Lester Brown, who was almost the inventor of the Green Revolution, is that if we're very fortunate, we may be able to keep world food production up to the current levels, approximately, the per capita food production, for another two decades. OK, what does that mean? Well, of course, you have to ask the question, what are you going to do with those two decades? Well, the answer is, if you don't have a massive effort on population control, all those two decades will do is make the situation worse. We have a great deal of information about what happens when you have a green revolution without population control. For instance, in the middle of the 18th century, the potato was introduced to Ireland where two million people were living on the edge of starvation. There was a green revolution. A huge monoculture of potatoes was created. As a result, the Irish population increased until there were roughly eight million people living on the verge of starvation. That, by the way, is the standard sequence when you increase food supply. You just increase the number of starving people. Now. Then what always happens with a monoculture inevitably turned up. Something got into it, the potato blight in this case, a fungus, I'm told, and the potato was wiped back. As a result, there was a huge famine. Close to a million Irishmen died, close to two million Irishmen migrated. So what did you have? Since you can't migrate now, the analogy would be essentially this. You had two million people living in misery. You had a green revolution. You ended up with eight million people living in misery. 3 million of them died, you ended up with 5 million people living in misery. Not a very cheering thought. Let's suppose we do have, however, a crash program on population control for the next 20 years. What will happen? Well, an extraordinary result, one that nobody in their wildest dreams think is possible, it would be for everybody in the world today to instantaneously decide that they are not going to have large families, and for the completed family size, say, to instantly move down to 2.3 for the world, which would be a drop, say, of about two children, two or three children. Fantastic result. What would happen? Well, unhappily, what would happen is the population would continue to grow, the world as a whole, until something like 2050, and of the United States as a whole, until something like 2030. Now, why is that? It's because of the age structure of the population. In the world as a whole, almost 40% of the people are under 15 years of age. And in the underdeveloped countries, the never-to-be-developed countries, somewhere between 40 and 50% of the people are under 15 years of age. 
This means that if you assume that we don't have a disaster, which we're clearly going to have, that is, if the age-specific death rates remain the same, these people, these children, are going to have children and grandchildren themselves before they get old enough to move from the 0 to 15 age class to the 50 to 65 age class, where they will begin to be subject to the high death rates that come from old age and disease at that level. This means that there's a fantastic inertia built into the system. That's why biologists are so desperately interested in getting population control underway as early as possible, hopefully 25 years ago, because there is such a tremendous lag time built into having any kind of success at cutting seriously into your growth rate or bringing about stability. That's the name of the game. You've got to start on population control instantly to have any kind of results decades ahead. Let me point out to you, for instance, that even if not another baby was born in the world from this instant forward, the demand for food, the real demand, not the economic demand, the economic demand also, and the stress on our planet and our natural resources would increase for at least a decade, simply because people in a 0 to 10 age class would be moving into the 10 to 20 age class faster than the few old people would be dying off. In other words, the needs of the population would increase simply with its aging. What this means fundamentally is that even if we do everything right from now on, we face colossal disasters in the future simply because of the food population gap that is inevitable, putting aside a lot of other things, and I'll return to that also. Now, the rest of the resource situation is also grim, as you probably know. Perhaps the one that's most desperate after food is water because it's so tightly tied in with food. Uh, we are steadily mining our fossil waters. The outtake in the United States is estimated to be about two times the input, and that's water that accumulated over thousands of years. In, in uh, England and Europe, it's about three to one. We're now starting, because of our attempts to put high-yield grains into India, a tremendous programs of tube wells there, which are going to lower their water table and so on. Fundamentally, what we're doing is we're converting fresh water to salt. And you've got to remember that water is extraordinarily important to agriculture. I hope everybody here knows that. Many people, ecological activists in the Bay Area, are likely to say, save water, don't take baths. Uh, as you know, if nobody ever took another bath, we'd still be in trouble for water, because agriculture and then industry are the big users of water. So we're very short of water. In fact, a lot of the, a lot of the strife that's developing in the world is developing over water resources. As far as petroleum goes, you all know that where the action is there. We're running out rapidly. Some estimates are it'll all be gone by the year 2000, and conflict over that is getting to be rather serious. In hard resources, it varies from resource to resource. The United States now uses 30 percent, roughly, of all the raw materials used in the world, although we're only 6 percent of the population. Our general projections are to be consuming 50 or 60 percent by 1980, if the other people are silly enough to let us have it. Uh, but even if we manage to steal every last bit of everybody else's everything, uh, we'll run out of a lot of things before the first part of the next century is gone, just with our patterns of consumption. Dave Brower, by the way, calls this pattern of behavior grand larceny against the future. Uh, I can understand Americans perhaps not caring about stealing from the other people who live on the planet because they have to be funny colors and so on. What do they need it for? But, uh, you know, Americans profess to love their children, and yet we're quite happily destroying the only resources on the planet that those children can use uh, to have a decent life of their own. But then again, what the hell did posterity ever do for us? So we have a desperate resource situation. I wish that was all there was to our problems, but of course overlying the whole thing is the general problem of environmental deterioration. Now, uh, as you all know, when an animal population overstrips its, its environment and fouls it up, what ordinarily happens is that it dies off. And of course, that's an option that's available to us. That's the animal solution to our problems. And the die-off can take many, many different forms. Now, if you listen to most politicians, you find out that environmental deterioration uh, means watery eyes uh, from smog, uh, and a lot of garbage around the landscape. If they're a little more sophisticated, they understand that the smog is killing you stone cold dead. If you're a Los Angelino and you have children, raising your children in Los Angeles simply means that statistically you're murdering them. They will die early of cardiovascular disease, emphysema, bronchitis, a number of exotic cancers and so on. Uh, something or other get, will get them early because they were raised in Los Angeles. As you may not know, they are now phasing physical education out of the public schools of Los Angeles because the air is unsafe to breathe if you breathe deeply. It's also unsafe to breathe if you breathe shallowly, but it's worse if you breathe deeply. <laughs> They're doing the same thing in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, but that's not all that serious. You've got to remember uh, that this, this direct assault uh, on you, in this case, isn't all that serious because it gets you late in life. Uh, 
Similarly, the DDT and other chlorinated hydrocarbon load isn't all that serious. You young people here are all part of a wonderful experiment that the petrochemical industry is running on all the human beings of the Earth and all the other organisms. So find out how, much, how many decades will be taken off your life if you have DDT and other chlorinated hydrocarbons uh, in your bodies from the time you're conceived. We now know that it's, it's in the fetuses uh, on up through, through the end. The evidence is beginning to pile up lots and lots of it, to indicate that it may not only be years, it may actually be decades. Everybody in this room may die 20 years young uh, simply because we're using hard pesticides. Now, of course, that's a very small price to pay for the profits of the industry, and uh, we should all be willing to pay it because it's very important uh, that our friends there make their money. So uh, you shouldn't worry about that either. In other words, sure, it kills you stone cold dead, but it doesn't kill you until after you're 30. And most reproduction goes on between the ages of 20 and 29. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter. You see, our species for some four million years, or our, our mankind, not our species, but mankind persisted perhaps four million years with a 30-year life expectancy, and we could go on for another four million with a 30-year life expectancy. So don't worry about that. It's not important. The critical thing that we're doing to the planet, of course, is attacking those ecological systems upon which our existence immediately depends. What you're doing when you add DDT and roughly half a million other dangerous substances to the ecological systems of the world is poisoning out elements in them. You know, the industry says, well, look, who cares about those dicky birds, those brown pelicans, those peregrine falcons, who cares about the fishes and so on? Uh, well, of course, some people do care about them because they happen to think they're aesthetic or that people are compassionate. But fundamentally, you've got to remember that those dicky birds dying are the symptoms of the destruction of the systems upon which our lives depend. Very, very critical. For instance, I had a, uh, a wonderful agriculturalist say to me, it doesn't make any difference if we kill the sea like we killed Lake Erie. Uh, because we don't get very much food from the sea. Well, it's typical. We only get maybe 2 or 3% of our calories from the sea, so that's a very small portion of mankind's diet. But we get 20% of our animal protein from the sea. If you get rid of that 20% of the animal protein, which we may well, by the end of the next decade, the world will be pitched into the worst famines it's ever seen. Almost certainly civilization will disappear. That's the kind of threat that the petrochemical industry represents to us. They may have already done us in, in fact, because, as you may not know, if we never add another molecule of DDT or any of these other substances to the environment, uh, it will still be roughly a decade or more before the peak of the runoff of these substances hits the sea. And recent work by Dr. Rory Laux at the University of Wisconsin indicates it may be a decade or more beyond that before the most serious effects in the food chains are felt. So we may be like the dinosaur shot in the pine brain. We're dead, but we don't know it yet. Now. Another thing has to do with the subtle effects of air pollution, and I'm not going to go into detail on this because I know Dr. Reed Bryson was here, and he's the guy who knows the most about it of anyone. I just point out to you that the critical thing in the world as far as air pollution is concerned is not the fact that it kills you young, but the fact that it may dramatically change our climate. It is certainly uh, that single thing probably represents the greatest single threat of famine in the world at this moment and in the United States. As you know, we're already cooling the planet. If the weather changes, which now seem to be entrained in the United States of the wrong kind, our corn production may go and a great deal of our wheat production, and we may be hungry very, very fast because we do not have that large a reserve supply in the United States. There are other dramatic catastrophes that could occur because of weather change, but I don't think I'll bother to go into them because if you've heard Bryson, you've gotten the word. Uh, one of the interesting side effects, as he probably mentioned, of the SST, that marvelous technological advance, uh, might be the end of the world uh, due to climatic change. But again, it's a nice giveaway to the aircraft companies, and we wouldn't want to hit their profits either. Now, there are two other areas of disaster that are population connected in the environment, which I have to mention. One has been ignored by almost everybody except uh, the biologists who are in the know, Sir McFarland Burnett uh, and Joshua Lederberg, to name two Nobel laureates, have been screaming about it for years, but nobody will listen. And that is every person you add to the planet dramatically increases the chances of having a worldwide plague which could kill almost everyone. See, we have the world's largest, the world's weakest, and the world's densest population. There are more hungry people today than there were people in 1875. We're an absolute setup for a worldwide plague, particularly since we have fine transportation to take people from country to country and continent to continent in a matter of hours. In 1967, we almost had the solution to the population explosion, a virus transferred from monkeys to men in a laboratory in Marburg, Germany, a virus that was never before seen in human beings. It was an extraordinarily lethal virus. 30 people got it before we were fortunate enough to contain it. Seven of them died. Now, in the population that got infected was a, a particularly resistant population for a number of reasons. First of all, the people were neither very young nor very old. 
so they were better able to resist the disease. Second of all, they had excellent medical care, and third of all, they were very well fed. If that disease had gotten out into mankind at large, uh, it would not have been impossible for three quarters of the entire population to die. Now, the thing that was really shocking and really horrified biologists was that the monkeys with the virus were in the London airport two weeks before the transfer took place in Marburg. If, of course, it had transferred to food handlers in the London airport or something like that, it would have been so long probably to almost everybody in this room. Uh, if you don't want to count on a virus, a natural virus, transferring from a, another animal into man to do the job, and this happens repeatedly, uh, there's always the possibility, indeed some virologists feel a certainty, of developing more lethal flu strains, for instance, as the substrate for human viruses gets larger and larger and we have more and more people, and people get weaker and weaker. Uh, if it's not for that, you can count on the biological warfare laboratories of the world to supply a solution. Uh, there's rumors now of the development of a mnemonic rabies, one that's transmitted in droplets like the common cold. Uh, it's certainly possible since we know that under some circumstances normal rabies can be transmitted that way. It would be interesting if that got loose accidentally because it could easily kill every single person on the globe. There's a zero recovery rate uh, from rabies once you're infected. Uh, so, and don't think that there are good safety precautions in biological warfare laboratories. Our establishment, as far as we can determine, is still going on. It's the intersection of two interesting sets. First of all, it's the set of moral, pygmy, incompetent biologists who would do that kind of work, combined with the most incompetent people in our military establishment, because the chemical corps has been the dumping ground for the people, if you can imagine it, who couldn't make a go of it in West Point. So uh, in, in, I got, got it. Little gin helps. So we have, you know, in virus laboratories that are run by responsible scientists, accidents are a very, very common occurrence. So don't count on well, safety from the biological warfare establishments around the world. We've already had Western equine encephalitis escape from one of our establishments in uh, Utah, for instance. Well, and finally, of course, as the political scientists tell us, every person you add to the planet increases the chances of a thermonuclear war. Everybody can see that anyway, because, of course, the finite amount of resources, whatever your technology is, every person you add reduces the per capita slice and the slice of each country. So uh, all I'll say about thermonuclear war is that the geniuses like Herman Kahn and so on who do their wonderful country A, country B analysis, the, the, the group of people known as deterrence theorists, uh, I could tell you very funny stories about deterrence theory, but you'd have to know something about systems analysis to understand them. What I can tell you is it's, it's one of the larger hoaxes. Uh, fortunately, you play the hoax on the military men, which is kind of easy. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the thing they never consider, of course, is the overall ecological effects of the war. In other words, it's quite clear that masses, huge masses of people will be killed immediately by blast and radiation. Well, the chances are not small that the rest of mankind would die out simply because the carrying capacity of the planet would be so dramatically reduced by weather change, by radiation, by the death of the oceans, and so on and so forth. Well, so we have a number of problems facing us. The picture is not altogether cheery. Uh, what might one do about this? Well, uh, I'm happy to tell you that there are solutions to these problems. I think if we did a lot of things and did them right, we could probably buy ourselves a 50-50 chance of getting to the end of the century. Some of my colleagues disagree, but I think it's at least worth a try. Uh, the trouble is, of course, that although the solution is very, very simple in outline, it's extraordinarily complex in execution. I mean, what would you want to do in outline? Well, the first thing you'd want to do is simultaneously get going on population control and environmental cleanup. Now, it'd be relatively simple in the United States if we had a president. Uh, to get going on population control. And uh, it's... We have the communication system and so on. It could almost certainly be done, and I'll be glad to discuss methods with you without any coercion and very pleasantly and so on. But it's fundamentally very important that we set a policy and get going on population control for a number of reasons. One is, of course, that our population growth is the most serious in the world because we're the big looters and polluters. Uh, population growth among affluent white Americans and our equivalents in the Soviet Union and Japan and Western Europe. So we're doing the most damage. We have the most serious population problem. We ought to get started on curing it, if for no other reason than it'll save us a lot of money and a lot of grief, and it will put us into a position where we might suggest similar things to other people. Nobody's going to listen to us. Uh, as long as we have the most serious population problem in the world at home and are not doing anything about it. So that's the first step. The second step, of course, is to move from what Kenneth Boulding has aptly described as a cowboy economy uh, and move to a spaceman economy. Fundamentally, 
move from an economy in which you emphasize throughput, consumption, production, wastage, pollution. The idea, you know, basically is that you can foul your nest if you're a cowboy, but then move west and find another place. It may work still in Iowa, but we're up against it in San Francisco. Uh, so, and switch to an economy in which everything is recycled, in which you emphasize the quality of your capital, the quality of your people, and shoot for a high standard of living, which we don't do now, of course. Now, that is, would require a series of rather fundamental changes in our economic outlook, and we would have to persuade the Soviets and others to do it. I point out that one of the advantages in this battle is that the communist and capitalist systems work exactly the same as far as the environment is concerned. It doesn't matter where the profits go. Uh, the, both systems are extremely exploitative, and both have to be changed uh, very dramatically. Uh, as you, by the way, as you may know, the United States government has done absolutely nothing, zero, zip, on either the population or environment question. Uh, you will be able to tell when the government gets even mildly serious about environmental problems when it takes the one small step which most rapidly, virtually instantaneously, uh, could do the most good without any technological change and so on, doing something we already know how to do. What would that be? It would be to instantaneously say, there will be no more large automobiles manufactured or driven in the United States, period. In other words, everybody is going to have their big old car bought back, say a one-year transition period, and everybody is going to have to drive a small car, one to a family, period. Low compression ratio engines, so on. What would happen? Well, your transportation would improve. Uh, You've got to remember that you can drive a small car as fast as a big one, and if the big ones are gone, you can feel safe in it. So there'd be, the roads would be less clogged. You could get to work just as fast or faster. You could park easier. That's number one. The cars could be designed to last forever. You could, for instance, take out the copper and replace it with aluminum, which means that after you were done with them, 30 years later, you return them to the factory, and they can be melted down to high-quality steel scrap and recycled. The copper is what makes steel scrap today relatively useless. Uh, you would immediately reduce your air pollution by a dramatic amount. You would take a lot of the pressure off the petroleum reserves of the world. You would take a lot of pressure off metal reserves in the world. Uh, you would free a lot of Detroit's, you, by the way, you might have to pay for this thing on the installment plan over, over 30 years because it might be very expensive, uh, but you would just have one car and you'd use it all that time. You would reduce the amount of PCB pollution and other pollutions that comes from vaporizing tires, a very serious part of our air pollution problem because the tires could be smaller. You'd have less asbestos pollution. Uh, you would free a lot of Detroit's productive capacity to start doing some of the other things that need to be done in the country, such as building housing for the many Americans who don't have any worth talking about, putting in rapid transit systems all over the country, which are badly needed, because getting to small cars is just a bare first step on the problem, but an important one. Uh, we've thought very hard about this, and we've only come up with one disadvantage to doing this, and that is that American men would learn, have to learn to get their sexual kicks out of sex instead of automobiles. Uh, but we think they could be trained to do that. Now, now we've got to start on this in our country. Then we have to turn around and look at the rest of the world situation, and I mean virtually immediately. We have to persuade the other overdeveloped countries to go down the same route. It may be quite possible, you know, the Soviets and bad as our government is, it's about 15 years ahead of the Soviets, which is kind of mind-boggling. But they're finally beginning to catch on to the fact that they're in trouble. I think the best thing that's happened to the Soviet Union in the last few years is that they've so loused up their rivers that the sturgeon have essentially disappeared, and with them the caviar. And uh, as you know, Russians, uh, vodka and caviar are the staff of life, and while they, they're drinking more vodka now to bemoan the loss of the caviar, a standard joke in Soviet scientific circles is now that marvelous, wonderful Soviet technology has managed to produce an artificial caviar, which is absolutely indistinguishable from the real thing, except by taste. So uh, I, I can encourage you by telling you that there are people in the Soviet Union, as well as people in the West, who recognize that on our little spaceship, we can no longer continue to play the kind of funny games we play now. Academician Sakharov, the youngest person ever elected to the Soviet Academy of Sciences and the father of the Russian H-bomb, published an extremely courageous uh, document on peaceful existence, coexistence, and uh, peaceful coexistence, and so on and so forth. I can't remember the title of it. And by the way, don't kid yourself, a Soviet society, repressive as ours is, Soviet society is still more repressive, and he's had trouble. But he pointed out that we just keep, can't keep going on this way. And he pointed out also what I think everybody in the West agrees on who's looked into the problem, and that is if we're to solve the world problem, get the overdeveloped countries de-developed, and for the first time, try and help the underdeveloped countries, 
that it's going to set us back, say, in the United States, an equivalent of at least 50 billion bucks a year into the foreseeable future. That's the cost of survival. Now, right now, if you divide the world into the northern hemisphere with the well-fed, overdeveloped countries and the southern hemisphere with the starving people, the poor countries, and so on, what you find is that fundamentally our approach to them is not one of aid, it's one of exploitation and stealing. For instance, protein is the short thing in the world. We get seven units of protein from them for every five we send back. For instance, the Peruvian anchovy fishery yields 10 million metric tons of fishes annually. That's a very large chunk of the world's fisheries production. The total is only uh, 65 million metric tons. We're, the overdeveloped countries take all of that produce, and what do we do with it? We feed it to our cats and to our dogs and to our pigs and to our chickens. In other words, we take it, some of it we put into absolutely useless things as far as human nutrition is concerned because we don't eat our cats and dogs. And what we put into other animals, we take essentially a 90% cut in the amount of protein. We take this food away from protein-starved people. We also, by the way, are taking it away so fast that the guano birds that depend on the fishery too are dying back, and so there isn't such a large supply of guano, which is the only thing that Peruvian Indians can afford as a fertilizer, and so Peruvian Indians in the Alta Plano are running short of food because of this behavior too. Off of Morocco, the Moroccans started an, a small fish, an anchovy-like fish fishery, with the idea of supplying cheap protein to the starving people of the Middle East. American cat food manufacturers outbid the people who were going to buy it in the Middle East. That's something that makes us very popular over there. General pattern is we keep them producing commodities, we keep Brazil producing coffee, and so on and so forth, and sending us what we need, uh, and the whole situation has got to be reversed. For the first time, we have got to really try and help the rest of the people in the world, and that means a tremendous effort on population control, which will mean training many, many sociologists, anthropologists, and so on in the overdeveloped countries and sending them down there to try and get the job done. It's going to mean really helping them with their agriculture, not trying to build the exports of American agribusiness of incredibly dangerous pesticides and synthetic nitrogen fertilizers and so on, but going down there and trying to help them to solve their agricultural problems in ecologically sensible ways. For instance, if you mechanize Indian agriculture, if you should be able to do that, you would destroy the country. What would happen? You would force all kinds of people off the land. They already have extraordinarily serious urbanization problems because there's nothing for people to do in their cities. Some of their cities are growing in the underdeveloped world at 7 and 8% a year, doubling their size every 10, 15 years or less. If you mechanize their agriculture, you'll cause a social disruption the likes of which the world has never seen. You've got to find ways to develop their agriculture and keep it labor intensive. All kinds of problems like this. But fundamentally, what we want to do is stop population growth there as well as in the overdeveloped countries, see to it that they get decent diets, decent housing, decent medical care, and change the world food, uh, trade situation so that they can have access to those products of industrial society that really make for a high standard of living, not for a large GNP, but for a high standard of living. This could be done. Of course, every time the UNCTAD conferences are held, the, the poor nations plead with the rich nations to give them a break, and they never get it. But sooner or later, they're going to have to get it if we're going to survive on this planet. Let me point out to you that there is zero possibility of remaining a fortress America or a fortress Soviet Union and letting the rest of the world go down the drain. That's one thing biological warfare cured for us. It removed that possibility. Every nation in the world is in a position to create doomsday weapons. Every biologist in the world knows how to do it. Very, very simple-minded. And uh, if you think that they will sit by and let us steal them blind and then let us sit by while they starve, uh, you've got another thing coming. Uh, the, the situation is not lost on the intelligent people of the Southern Hemisphere. So it's either going to be uh, help them swim or sink with them. That's all there is to it. There are no other choices. Well, you're all sitting there saying, well, this is the most ridiculous, utopian, uh, unrealistic, idealistic thing I've ever heard. And I tend to agree. Uh, I'm not a fool. I think, yes, we could get ourselves a 50-50 chance of survival. Uh, because I think if we really tried to change the world system, really tried to improve the quality of our lives and tried to improve the quality of other people's lives, uh, that when the disasters that are inevitable arrive, there will be no reason for anybody trying to sink the ship or start a war, because after all, we'll already be in a situation where we're doing everything possible to help everybody. If, on the other hand, when the disasters arrive, we are trying to live in a fortress America, then it's almost certain the balloon will go up and we'll say bye-bye to the whole system. So. It's idealistic, and it's utopian, and I think that we won't do it. I think that actually our chances of doing it are less than 2%, or maybe even smaller than that. But the thing is that we could. The interest, interesting and ironic that at the moment we're in a situation where the only realistic solutions left for mankind are ones that we used to laugh at as being utopian or Christian or idealistic. Now, we have not only 
could we do it, we have a way that we can do it in the United States. Uh, a lot of people are talking nowadays about revolution. What we got to do is tear down this miserable structure and build a new one. Well, I'm not a fan of that idea for a number of reasons. First of all, if you look at the history of revolutions, uh, there's very little sign that the probabilities are high that if you tear down what we have now, what will be rebuilt will be definitively better. Uh, in fact, very often it turns out to be worse. It would be a tremendous gamble. More important than that, though, if you try a revolution now, you'll destroy a great deal of the country, and what you'll be doing is selling out the rest of the people in the world who are going to depend on us for survival if there's any hope of survival at all. In other words, we simply haven't got time. We're either going to cure this problem by bending our present institutions, or we're not going to solve it at all. And this means we're going to have to take political action. For the first time, at least 10 million Americans are going to have to get together and start paying attention to the swindles that are going on in Washington and so on. Most Americans don't have the vaguest notion what goes on in Washington. They have the funniest ideas that, that, that people who know have ever heard. It's absolutely hilarious. Sure, the pressure groups run the country. They run the country because people don't pay any attention. The great advantage we have is that a basically excellent system, a ballot system, exists which can be used it hasn't been used for so long that the people who control the country just don't, can't even imagine anybody using it, but it can be done. I've talked to a lot of the good guys in Congress, and there are many of them, mostly young, mostly relatively powerless, but of both parties, it's strictly nonpartisan. If you want to list the boobs in government and the good guys, you'll find Democrats and Republicans on both lists in abundance. Uh, all of them agree that there isn't any congressman or any candidate that couldn't be elected to the United States Congress if 5,000 people are willing to get out and spend three or four months before election working two or three hours a day for them, stuffing envelopes, making phone calls, eventually driving people to the polls, going from door to door, and so on. The system can be made to work. The question is, do people want to survive enough to try and make it work? Well, fundamentally, the choice is up to you, and I wish you luck. Thank you. Dr. Ehrlich said he would answer a few questions if there are any. Are there questions? Okay, I'll, I'll field them. No. Uh, let me make something perfectly clear. If any of you want. <laughs> if, if you have any. Anybody there? Can you hear me? Yeah. If you, have, if you have any ideas about getting academicians working as politicians, I suggest, I, I hope students here have a big say in the university and, and are on committees and do attend meetings. I suggest that you, uh, if you don't, ask for representation and cycle yourself slowly through academic senate meetings or the equivalent or academic council. And you can see that bad as the government is, if it was infested with academics, it would be worse. I think it's, it's very important. We have very good young politicians. We have guys like Governor Hughes, who I think have all the right kinds of instincts and are willing. What, what you need is people who really want to survive, who aren't interested in serving special interests, who are willing to recognize that a lot of the structure of our government has to change. You know, you say that, everybody says, wow, he's a communist. Actually, uh, we've gone a long way away from our democracy in many respects. For instance, as you all know, your share of United States senator gets smaller every year when your population in your state gets larger. We don't have any control, any democratic control, over the executive agencies. You know, the FAA is run by the airlines. The Department of Agribusiness is run by agribusiness. We have the situation that's developed where the foxes end up, have ended up guarding the hen house, and there's no way to get into them. We have the seniority system in the, in the Senate and the, in the House, which isn't in the Constitution, but which prevents us, for instance, uh, in, in most of the country, from having any real representation at all. You have to get a president who's going to get in there and say, look, I'm not an expert in any area necessarily, but I do know this. The system isn't working. We've got to change it. And we're not going to start running the government until we start revising uh, the way the executive agencies work until we get rid of the seniority system in Congress, and then we're going to start paying attention to national and international matters, to the things that are really critical 
instead of trying to take care of all of our parochial interests. And this means we're going to get the hell out of Vietnam, we're going to solve our race problem, period, and so on and so forth. Now, nobody is able to keep track of the whole thing. Let me tell you that I have, because of coincidence, uh, gotten involved in essentially a network of perhaps 30 or 40 people who are trying to keep track of just the primarily biological aspects of the environmental crisis and the population crisis. It's all we can do as a group to stay semi-informed on what's going on because there's so much, you know, there's so much going on. That's why a lot of structural changes have to take place in the government and the president has to be a person very well advised by people who have only the country's interests at heart. There are ways that you can do this. It can be done, but it's going to be tough. But fundamentally, you don't want experts, particularly somebody like me. Uh, my, my biggest fault is I've never learned to suffer fools gladly, and politicians have to learn how to do that. So I have no interest in the office, and I will not be a political candidate, and so on and so forth. You know? And they say, well, you've heard that before. What can I say? Uh, well, we are going to need a new political party, I'm afraid. In other words, it's not clear that either party will produce the right candidate next time, in which case we're going to have to have a brand new party. There's lots of precedent for that. Remember, the Republican Party developed before the Civil War on a single issue. Uh, we can do it on a multiple issue. So another question. All right, sorry. What? Uh, the question is, in the next few years, will people be living off of artificial organs and so on? That, all the transplant business and so on is fundamentally, as far as the problem we're talking about is concerned, is a, a strong system of the gross mismanagement and misdirection of American medicine. In other words, there are not enough old people in the world to make any difference whatever we do with them. In other words, we ought to obviously try and keep people alive and well who are already on the planet. But as far as organ transplants and so go, they're available to so few people they're essentially disastrous, they're experimental, they raise all kinds of interesting social problems and very difficult ones, but none that we're going to have to face seriously uh, if we don't get through the coming crisis. So it's really a side issue. And uh, he was telling us that the government could solve all these problems by pouring money into producing breeder reactors, thus producing an inexhaustible source of energy. Then he proposes that we would be able to desalt the ocean water, produce an inexhaustible source of water. Right, so the, qu the question is, uh, referring to Dr. Alvin Weinberg, the king of the technological optimists, who says that if you just pour enough money into breeder reactors, you'll solve the problem because you'll be able to desalt ocean water and so on and so forth. Well, let me say that I agree with him. If we poured immense amounts of money into breeder reactors, we'd solve the problems because the chances are that we would be the last generation on the face of the earth. Uh, the, the trouble with Dr. Weinberg is that he just doesn't know anything about biology. And of course, breeder reactors, besides being extraordinarily dangerous devices in their present state of technology, uh, also add things to the atmosphere that we can't afford to have in the atmosphere. So in brief, the story on nuclear power is we don't want a single nuclear power plant in this country until we have a decent technology. And that probably won't be until we get into the second stage of fusion devices with deuterium-helium fusion. The way to solve our power problems is not to build more power plants, it's to decrease the demand for power. You open your, uh, your, your bill, your electric bill, and in it is this funny little slip that says, uh, get an electric toothbrush, an electric comb, electrically heat your car, electrically heat your uh, house, and so on and so forth. And then you pick up the newspaper, and here is some cretin from the local power industry saying, we've got to destroy the entire state and take all these chances in order to keep up with this terrible demand for power. Uh, we're in a race for our life, they, one guy said in California, to keep up with power demand. Well. Uh, obviously, it's nonsense. A fantastic amount of our power, for instance, goes into making aluminum beer cans, which are another pollutant. The, I've been over this in great detail with nuclear physicists. I work very closely with one. We have done a detailed analysis of the desalinization myth. Again, what, uh, what Weinberg doesn't understand is how much water is needed for agriculture. You, we've done all the calculations. No one in the next 30 years will desalt one drop of water for standard agriculture. In fact, it's marginal. Desalting with nuclear power is marginal for drinking water in most areas and only in coastal areas. Uh, what these guys can't do is their arithmetic or their homework. They know one little narrow slice. The Atomic Energy Commission, of course, is intellectually perhaps the biggest disaster area in the government. Uh, you may have, have you all heard of the Seaborg hypothesis? It's named in honor of the, uh, the guy who's the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. And the idea there is that any poison you add to the planet, if you add one, say, one drop 
per billion drops of ocean, the instantaneous concentration everywhere is one in a billion. In other words, they do not understand that biological systems concentrate things. They also don't understand that if you have 100 plants letting out a drop at a time, that doesn't leave it just one drop per billion. You get 100 drops per billion. Their own scientists, Drs. Goffman and Tamplin, health physicists working at the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, have recently stated that the AEC's um, limits for radiation emission are at least set 10 times too high. I think that's also a conservative guess. Fundamentally, the whole nuclear thing is, is, is an exercise by bomb physicists to soothe their, their consciences. You see, they blew, started us on the road to blowing up the world, and they really want to find a way to justify it, and their way of justifying it is pushing nuclear power before it's ready to go. The Fermi Fast Breeder Reactor almost blew outside of Detroit. If it had gone, it would have made more than 10% of the United States uninhabitable and killed several million people if the weather conditions had been right. That's the kind of risk you're running. I don't know a single nuclear physicist who would be willing to live downwind of a nuclear power plant. Certainly I wouldn't be. Uh, there was a lady back there who's up for right. You'll have to talk louder because I can't hear you. I can't, you'll have to come closer to that I can't, or somebody else. Okay. Sorry. Uh, you've stated that you would like to see population control drop out to the consciousness of the future. And the contrast in view to this is the consciousness will be spread out. Therefore, I'd like to see the All right. control. I, I indicated that, that I would like people to essentially voluntarily uh, control their their population, which, uh, which she said means you'll have to do it through the conscience of the people, and the consequence of this would be that the conscience would be bred out. The question fundamentally is, uh, is often given another form, if the intelligent people who recognize the problem stop breeding, won't the intelligence of the human race decline? Well, the answer is this. At the moment, there's not the slightest sign that intelligent people breed less than unintelligent people as far as genetics is concerned. But let's, uh, let's assume that that's happening. Let's assume that there is a differential and that intelligent people start breeding somewhat less than unintelligent people. That would, have, that would amount to natural selection against intelligence. Well, considering the kinds of differentials that might be possible, my guess is it would take roughly 15 generations, 10 anyway, before you'd be able to perceive any change. This means somewhere around 250 years. Now, the nice thing about selecting on quantitative characters like intelligence is that you can always reverse it. In other words, if 250 years from now, after we've been through this crisis, and it would, would mean if you were going to continue to keep the population down, you would have had a civilization going for another 250 years. If you didn't know enough about genetics to intervene directly and make people smarter, uh, then you could simply reverse the selective trend by, giving, uh, by encouraging the more intelligent people to breed and putting sanctions, if necessary, against the less intelligent people if you could measure their genetic intelligence. So fundamentally, the answer is there might eventually be a quality problem in the human population. Uh, if intelligent people did indeed breed less than unintelligent people. Uh, but that is so far in the future that facing the kind of quantity problem that we now face, uh, there is no point in worrying about it, particularly if you get into the problem you see of who breeds and who doesn't, you immediately exacerbate what's already a difficult problem of getting everybody to stop. Furthermore, if you're concerned about the intelligence of mankind, uh, there are many things you can do right now to increase it that don't involve any tricky population genetics, and I've oversimplified the population genetic situation. For instance, you can take advantage of the tremendous genetic potential in our society for intelligence that is never tapped. The intelligence of women, the intelligence of blacks, the intelligence of Chicanos, and so on. Very simple job if you want more intelligent human beings. Another question. Is the mic still on? Can everybody still hear? Yeah, all right, fine. Right there. I'll get you next. Major areas of conflict in the population of crimes right in this country. And secondly, lacking qualified uh, candidates for public office, what kind of pressure can you put on the government from a grassroots level right now? Oh, too good. The first, the first question was, what, area, what main areas of conflict do I see in this crisis? Well, I think it's going to be an extremely tough crisis, and I think the main areas of conflict will come in economics. Now, it's very nice, and I've done a little of it today, to sort of indicate that industry is the big problem, but of course that's really not true. Uh, the old the standard statement among ecologists is that we've met the enemy and they are us. In other words, uh, industry does things that we want them to do or have encouraged them to do. Municipalities do all kinds of crazy things. Agriculture is a major uh, polluter and so on and so forth. What we've got to do, you see, we've got a problem where if we 
try and solve it through individual action. For instance, if a farmer should try and just give up using nitrogen fertilizer or using pesticides, he would suffer, the innovator would suffer. For why would a farmer suffer? Because if he produces produce that has some insect damage, it'll be worth less money. We've got to train housewives to prefer a worm in her apple to starving to death or having a little bit of poison on the apple and so on. So it's very difficult on innovators. That's why society has got to act. So the big problem is going to be to design ways to get the economic changes that we need. To get the eco I don't think the population side in this country is going to be that important. I think people are going to go along with that because I think they're clued in. But I think the economic changes are going to present the greatest problem of seeing to it that society takes up, the, the part of, takes up part of the harm when differential harm is done. In other words, when you stomp on, on one group. When you tell the, in other words, the automobile industry is forced to stop what it's doing today. When we're going to have to force them to do it. They're not going to do it voluntarily. Uh, you've got to see to it that the automobile workers, the automobile companies, and so on and so forth are helped by society to transition to socially useful things. So that's where the big conflicts are going to come. Well, let's say, remind me what the second question. Oh, where, you were asked about there being a lack of responsible politicians. I don't think that's true, and I don't want to be misunderstood. There are many responsible politicians, but they're the ones who are still having a hard time, and the thing to do is get behind them. Uh, right now, Zero Population Growth, which is an organization which we founded a little over a year ago, and which is the only thing in the world, as far as I know, that's growing faster than the situation is deteriorating, is backing two people in California elections. Pete McCloskey, a very fine Republican, a guy with a lot of charisma. He's handsome, which means that, that he has 50% of the vote already. Uh, he is a Korean War veteran with a silver star from the Marines, the first Republican to say get out of Vietnam, a, an attorney who has fought all kinds of environmental lawsuits through and, and has, in a Catholic district, been a full-scale promoter of abortion. Uh, we're backing him for re-election. He's the guy you may know who beat Shirley Temple, uh, in, uh, which saved us one more horror in California politics. Uh, <laughs> We're backing him, and in the and in the there's a congressman named George Brown you may have heard of who is running for the Democratic nomination for the Senate. He's running against a guy named Tunney who looks like a Kennedy but votes quite differently. Uh, I think we may get.